Hi everyone, I'm Melissa Pillai and it's my pleasure today to welcome you to the Playbook webinar, The True Cost of Delaying a Product Launch. Our speakers today are myself, I'm the VP of Marketing for Playbook, and Scott Elliott, who's the founder of TechSec, who is also a Playbook partner. Scott is known globally for <clears throat> in high-tech electronic design, manufacturing, supply chain management, and research and development. He's founded various companies and has been COO and CEO of, of these companies. Scott was the worldwide manager of the process consulting business for Hewlett Packard's test and measurement organization, which is now called Key Site Technologies, based in Amsterdam and the Netherlands. He also led the supply chain consulting practice for Hewlett Packard. Prior to that, Scott worked for Lockheed Martin, now as founder and president of TechSec's consulting firm, which is based in San Francisco, that helps technology companies profit and grow to the next level. Scott brings with him a wealth of knowledge today, so we're glad to have him here. Uh, TechSec, as I said, is a playbook partner, and we are thankful Scott agreed to talk to you about the, cost, the true cost of delay. Um, please, please feel free to type your questions into the question box as we go. If you have time at the end, uh, we'll have a Q&A session. And if we don't, don't worry, we will follow up via email, and we will also be sending out a recording of the webinar. So with that, I'll hand it over to Scott. Okay, hello everybody, and uh, thank you for joining me. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, new product development velocity. And you may have heard uh, time to market or new product development speed, but actually when you're developing a new product, it's really a vector. It has, it has both a speed and a direction. Uh, and the direction is you're aiming towards a, a particular market, which you're trying to hit as centered as you can. A uh, particular market being a, an unmet need uh, that uh, gives customers some reason to buy your, your product. Of course, uh, this, this development takes time, and during that time, the target could very well be moving, and often is, for, especially for uh, fast clock speed kinds of industries, such as things like smartphones and so forth. So what I'd like to do is talk to you first about the, the basic economics of, um, of a new product development, of a product life cycle, as a matter of fact. Okay? So what I've presented here is a, is a, is a simple cash flow model of what's happening in, with a new product and a new product development. Uh, you probably have some kind of phases like investigation and development phase and then manufacturing phase and then finally obsolescence. Uh, now, during the investigation phase and development, you're just spending money. So I'm showing that as red down here, uh, spending cash, spending cash, spending cash. And it's growing uh, as you get closer and closer to manufacturing because uh, you're not only doing development, but you're now starting to spend on things like tooling and manufacturing parts and cost of goods sold, marketing sales, so forth and so on. So you're still earning no money at that time. Uh, we have a, uh, here are some time twos that people use in the industry. Um, time to manufacturing is when you start actually manufacturing your product. Uh, the time to market, which may be the same, uh, but maybe a little bit later, is the time when you actually launch the product on the market and start taking orders and start collecting revenues. So here's when the revenues uh, start coming in, and, and these are hopefully growing fairly rapidly. And at the point where the spending uh, of, on cost of goods sold and uh, development and so forth equals the revenue, that's called the break-even time. So you might be breaking even on the product at this point and even starting to make money, but you're still um, spending a lot of money as well. And then uh, as you approach some maximum volume, uh, one over E point here, that's, that's called the time to volume. Then hopefully you have some nice long uh, revenues coming in as you sell the mature product and finally it will probably ebb down and uh, be obsoleted by the competition or by your next product or whatever. Okay, so now if you look at the lower um, curve here, this is a cumulative cash flow, net cumulative cash flow, so it's sort of the point by point addition or subtraction, if you will, of this green and red curve here. And um, if you look at that, at some point when you get into manufacturing, you cut off your R&D investment, but you still are spending on cost of goods sold and materials and so forth. And um, you haven't uh, caught up because even though you might be breaking even, 
um, you've, you've spent all this money. So this is cumulative. You've spent all this money. And then after the break-even point, you start to pay off all that investment. And then at some point, you've paid off all of this R&D investment. Um, and you can uh, you, you start to, to get a real return. So uh, the time to profit here shown here really could be quite a ways into the manufacturing uh, life of this product. And then hopefully that grows and grows, and at some point you get some maximum, and you may have to actually spend a little more money um, to obsolete the product, you know, scrap parts and things like that. And um, so you, you, you achieve some kind of total return. All right. Now, I don't know how many of you have looked at it this way, um, how many of you are product managers or whatever, um, but you know, this is basically why companies uh, build products. They want to get this total return. There may be other reasons, strategic or so forth, but, um, but they really would like to see a positive return, uh, a significant return on a, on a new product development investment. So uh, I'd just like you to ask your, yourself, uh, who in your company do you think is, is total, uh, accountable for the total re product return on uh, product by product? Of course, the CEO is accountable for the total profit and loss of the company. But on a product by product basis, who is it? Some companies have a product manager that follows products all the way through their life cycle. Some companies, I even worked for a company where the project manager, the R&D project manager, was responsible for the total return of the project. Of course, that's a you know it could be a very long time before you find out what that is. But uh, but anyway, um, project managers think differently if if they're responsible for the total return, or it could be the chief marketing officer or somebody else in the organization. Anyhow, somebody should be thinking about this, and and in fact, in many companies. There really isn't anybody that really thinks about it very much, unfortunately. But let me turn to a um, particular case of a product, um, which is quite common these days, which is a fast, which is what I call a fast clock speed uh, product. Okay, so again, this might be like a, um, a smartphone or an inkjet printer or something like that, some product that you know, is developed pretty rapidly, put on the market, and might be only on the market for uh, nine months or a year or something like that before it's replaced by the next big thing or by the competition or, or whatever. So this kind of product has the, has the characteristics that uh, once it launches, it usually rises extremely rapidly uh, to, a peak, uh, to a peak sales. Think of the iPhone 6 or something like that. Uh, and then gradually and, and not so gradually, um, fades out uh, and gets replaced by the by the next product or by the competition. All right. Uh, so now uh, what you get, what you got to realize is that the total return on a product is really determined by the area under this curve divided by the area under this curve. So how much have you how much have you made compared to how much have you spent? Uh, that's the whole idea. It's very simple. Um, in, in, in these, just eyeballing these areas, this would not be a very good return on a product because it looks like it's about the same area, but never mind. Um, so people talk about a return factor, which is uh, the, you know, the total revenues divided by the total expenses. And uh, uh, companies I've worked for have, talked, have had rules of thumb like a, a return factor of four is acceptable, so anything less than four. Um, they would not start the start the development. Uh, anything over four is, is pretty good. All right. Now, um, <clears throat> I had a minor in in mathematics for my PhD, and um, at that time, I probably could have integrated under this curve and, and this curve. Uh, but since then, I've turned to management consulting, so I don't think I could do it anymore. <laughs> so now, what I do is I use a much simpler model, and it's just about as good as it turns out. And uh, let me give you that model. So you can actually compute or estimate the, the total return on a product uh, if you can find out some simple predictions or some simple um, numbers, really. OK, so if you look at the red line down here on this expending, spending part of the cash flow model, I'm just going to um, uh, model the, the spending by a, um, by a linear increase over one quarter to $4 million for this product. Um, a um, steady spending of 
four million dollars a quarter for a couple of quarters, and then uh, a linear decline down to a cost of goods sold, uh, and then uh, you know, kind of a constant cost of goods sold with a with a linear decline at the end here after nine quarters. Uh, similarly, on the uh, revenue side, let's estimate that you launch the product after two quarters, and if the volumes rise linearly for two quarters, and then revenue stays constant for about four quarters, and then drops off linearly again for one quarter. Okay, so it's a very simple uh, way to estimate things, but it turns out to be just as good as trying to do it in a more complex fa fa fashion, because these things are, are, are not very well known, as you can imagine. Looking, nobody can see into the future uh, very far. So then if you subtract these curves point by point, you get these uh, solid ones. And um, so basically, this is the net um, expenditures, and this is the net return coming in. And uh, now, with these simple curves, we can easily estimate things. Well, this is you know four million dollars for a quarter and two million dollars for two quarters, so that's a total of uh, cost of eight million dollars. And then similarly, like four uh, four quarters times seven million dollars plus two quarters times three and a half million dollars, that's a total profit of thirty five million dollars. So the return factor is three point seven five. Uh, that's a pretty good return factor. And most companies would say, yeah, well, let's go ahead and develop that product. If we can get that, that's a, that's a good return for the company. All right. So now let's talk about estimating what happens if we're late. And again, you can, you can play with these models. They're very simple to do and make your own estimations. This is just one estimation that I'm going to make, and um, it's not an uncommon scenario. And that is the management comes and tells you, tells you, okay, uh, we're expecting a return factor greater than four, and we're going to allow you to invest $8 million in the, in the development of this product, um, so, and we want you to get it out in three quarters. Okay, so the team gets together, and they look at it, and they say, well, you know, good, we got $8 million, but we can't really do it in three quarters because of long lead time items. We don't quite have the expertise, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, Let's, uh, let's spend that $8 million over four quarters, and we can do it then. So basically, for whatever reason, they're, they're a quarter late. You know, I, I've set this curve so it's the same area, $8 million area on the expenditures, and they're a quarter late. So what you see happens now on the revenue side is that the, 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 um, the end point hasn't changed. <laughs> the, the next big thing is going to come on kill off this product. So you know, your revenue grows linearly, and you probably don't quite achieve the same uh, peak revenues as, as you would have if you got it out on time, and then it de declines with the same uh, speed at the end. So now if you add up the, the area under this curve, you'll find that uh, you've only um, taken in $24 million okay, with the same $8 million cost. So this means that your return factors is 3 instead of 4.75, and the co this one quarter delay costs you $11 million. That's quite a bit, you know. So if uh, if management had known that this was going to be the case, they probably would not have launched you to develop this product. Similarly, um, uh, you can go back and play with these. But um, if 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 management could say, well, you know, instead of giving you four million dollars or or eight million dollars total, let's give you six million dollars to make sure you get this done on time. Uh, if you do those the, that model, you'll find that actually you come quite a bit closer to the same return factor a little bit less, but uh, you can get almost four. So uh, you can use these models to, to, to figure out what is the cost of delay and what could you do by spending a little money up front um, to, to tow that back in and get, get a better return on your, on your investment. All right, so um, what are the real consequences of delay? Well, um, we just looked at the fact that um, your, it'll cost your return factor, uh, but it can also cost you loss of market share. You know, if you don't get things out there in time, um, your competitor can can beat you to it and take a lot of market share. Uh, there's the there's the fact of a loss of credibility if the if the if the launch announcement is missed. So, so supposing you thought you were going to get it out on time and, and so you, you announced it and possibly even started taking orders for, for the product and then missed it by a quarter. Well, people don't like to wait an extra three months to get their product. So you make people angry. 
um, and um, and you lose credibility. And not only that, but uh, suppose you're shipping an iPhone 6 and you announce in, in May that uh, you're going to start shipping iPhone 7 in July. What do you think happens to your iPhone 6 orders? You know, Anybody that was about to order an iPhone 6 would say, oh, wait a minute, I'm going to wait for the iPhone 7. I can wait two months. But then you're a quarter late and you've lost the revenue from the iPhone 6 sales and plus the iPhone 7 sales plus a lot of credibility. Right? So then there's finally there's some really disaster scenarios like miss the boat, you know. For example, if you're developing some kind of uh, consumer item that you expect to get a huge portion of your sales uh, for the uh, Christmas shopping season, and this is includes a lot of companies, a lot of companies publish that they get 70 or 80 percent of their total sales on a product during the Christmas sale. So if you don't get that product out there in uh, by at least mid-September, um, you miss the boat. If it's not out there by mid-October, you you might have missed it completely. You might as well not not even put it on the market. So that's a real disaster scenario, and that happens sometimes. All right, so let's talk about what slows uh, the speed of development and. I'm sure you have your own um, list, but this is one I put together working out with, uh, with many clients over the years. Uh, and it's more or less in priority order, and I won't talk about all of them because you can read them. But um, the biggest case I've seen for slowing the speed is really inefficient team or individual empowerment. You know? And what this means is uh, pe people don't know who can make the decision. You know, it's not clear who's supposed to make the decision. And so what happens is the decision goes unmade until somebody makes it that might be even the wrong person to make it. And um, uh, you can trip all over things. And this can really uh, spin wheels and slow down projects tremendously. Another one is too many projects. I've seen so many cases going into a company that, say, has uh, 50 uh, development engineers or development people. And they have 60 or 70 projects, right? <laughs> this is not unusual. It's really true. And these can, and besides uh, R&D projects, there can be, you know, manufacturing improvement projects and all sorts of IT projects and things going on at the same time. It's just so distracting, and it, it uh, causes people to have to shift their thinking all the time, and it just takes a whole lot of time. Another one is development product bottlenecks. Okay, so. Um, in many cases, there are um, there's some part in the development proce process uh, in the company that is a bottleneck. Uh, for for instance, in uh, I work a lot in the electronics industry, and the, those people you know usually develop uh, printed circuit boards from a from an engineering drawing or schematic, and uh, it's often the case that they have a printed circuit board layout department with specialized software and specialized skills. You might have three or four people who, who do printed circuit layout, and they might have, you know, 30 engineers who are developing printed circuit boards. So, you know, you, you, you submit your schematic to the PC layout people, uh, and, they, and it goes into a queue, and they might have a long queue, and they say, well, you know, this, uh, I'll get to this in two weeks, and then uh, it takes me a day to do it, so you'll get it back in two weeks and a day, or something like that. Um, and the more people there are trying to get stuff in there, the longer the queue gets. So what happens after that, I've seen also is Engineers get frustrated and they say, "Oh, if I got to wait two weeks for my for my design to be laid out, I'm going to do like five different variations just to make sure that one of them is going to work." You know, so people start to putting in many times more than they need to. So uh, that's kind of an example of the organizational bottleneck that, that might happen. Uh, no organizational learning from mistakes on previous process. Uh, tools aren't very good. You know, for instance, if you don't have good um, simulation tools, um, then you may have to turn your PC board or your ASIC or whatever um, several times, and that always takes time. Unanticipated risk, oops, excuse me, unanticipated risks, um, missing resources that you need, poorly understood dependencies, and of course everyone now works for with uh, partners and suppliers, and uh, they, have, they have their own set of problems like this, so you know, they may be presenting you with the problem. Uh, finally, I want to talk a little bit about bureaucratic obstacles because I see this a lot, particularly in larger, more established companies, where, uh, and particularly in regulated environments, um, where um, 
you know, they have all kinds of bureaucratic uh, paperwork to fill out, as you will, or, or things like that. Or even in non-regulated environments, they, they may have uh, uh, things like um, a lot of formal project reviews, right? Formal project reviews give uh, upper management the illusion that they're in control of things, and so they demand it. And what happens during formal product review? Well, if you're in a development team, you know exactly what happens. You, you're asked to stop and go make some pretty slides, so it might cost you hours or days or even a week to, to go off and uh, prepare your part of the project review. All that's just wasted time. All right, so I want to bring this back to, to lean and agile development, because that's what um, uh, TechSex is about and what's Playbook about. And we both uh, have the same uh, seven principles of lean and agile development. Uh, and again, I won't go through all of these, but uh, uh, you can read what they are, and we'll talk a little bit more about them. But basically, uh, you know, you really want to have empowered teams, and the empowered teams uh, should have rolling, decentralized rolling weight planning. That means that you, you might have your project manager do the do the top level kinds of uh, tasks. You know, you got to develop this and you got to develop that. But then underneath that, you should have the people that are actually going to do the work, do their own planning. All right. Uh, then visibility of the management backlog, that means um, uh, visibility and management of the backlog. The backlog means the, the amount of the, the, the unfinished tasks that need to be done to develop the product. You know, What's the most important thing that needs to be done next? Um, minimize information transfer delays. Um, here, we, you, know, you see a lot of cases where a project might have a project meeting for a couple of hours once a, meet, or once a week or maybe a half a day, once every two weeks. Uh, and that can lead to um, a lot of delays in important information that should be transferred and, uh, and, and causes uh, delays in the project. Uh, resource loading at 70%. So this is the old uh, uh, crowded freeway thing where you really want to try to um, get your resources uh, not at 100% so that, uh, so that people can, uh, can move faster. So you can read the rest of these. Use a poll system for DAC backlog. Uh, make sure that you're managing to the critical path, that you understand where the critical path is and you're managing to it, in other words, feeding it, and eliminate non-value-added work and delays. These are the seven principles, and these are reflected in this slide, uh, which uh, says that lean and agile methods can increase your new product velocity by 50% or more. Okay, so... This is a pretty well known in the software world now where they use uh, Scrum and Agile techniques and Kanban techniques that have really, really increased their, the, the, the velocity of developing software products. And it's now starting to be used in hardware products, and that's what uh, Playbook is about. It allows you to do that easily. And the, again, the keys to, to, to doing this are the same as the, mostly the same as the principles we talked about, empowering the teams, making the backlog visible, um, breaking the project into chunks and then sprint to complete the chunks is what Agile is about. And that, uh, that uh, automatically decreases the, the time to transfer information and, uh, along with daily quick team huddles like 15-minute uh, meetings every day instead of you know, four-hour meetings every other week. Uh, you know, get people unloaded so they can work at least 75% of their time on a priority project. Uh, keep the critical path visible and eliminate non-valued work. Um, but wait, <laughs> if you act now, our operators are standing by. Just getting here. Um, there is another uh, big advantage of using lean and devel uh, development techniques, and that is that uh, the it has to do with the direction of the NPD velocity. Okay, the finished product is closer to the unmet needs of the customer. And why is that? Because the lean and agile methods really embrace changing requirements between sprints. You know, the old waterfall methods, you tried to really freeze the requirements hard and then, and then run, run, run for a couple of years to develop the product, but by that time, uh, the, the targets changed. In, in the sprint methodologies, the, um, the rapid sprints allow you to keep testing the market and see, see how it's changing. Thus, the product velocity is improved in both the speed and the direction. That's one big, real huge advantage. Okay, well, I've talked enough. Um, what I'd, I'd just like to summarize by saying that the, 
Delays in the launch of new products uh, can be very expensive and even disastrous. I hope I prove that. Um, the return factors on a new product is not difficult to estimate. So if you can go to marketing and try to figure out what the what the mature life cycle of the product's going to be, um, and then uh, I think it's easier to estimate what the, the development expenses are going to be. You can you can get a pretty good estimate of the cost of delay. And finally, that the lean and agile product development methods can really improve this, both the speed and the direction of, of your new product development and uh, get the target on time and the right target. Okay, that's it. If you, uh, if you have any questions about any of this, um, I believe that uh, Elise will, uh, will send you this slide set and um, you, can, you can easily uh, call me or e email me at, at scott.elliot at texx.com and I'd be very happy to uh, have a conversation with you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Scott. Um, as Scott said, please feel free to get in touch with Scott if you'd like to take a deeper dive into cost of delay. Um, and you can reach Playbook at playbookhq.co. Thank you very much. Bye.